Okay, so let me go right into the review. I'll do this by looking at a combined spreadsheet. So this spreadsheet took the, the one that you used that had an original field name and a Darwin Cord field name and a comments field. And what I did was to take answers from several of the people who had sent them to me and to highlight in colors which ones in green everyone got completely right. That was an easy one. The ones in slightly less green or yellow or ones where somebody got it right but at least one person got it wrong. And then in red where no one got it right. So you can see that there's a variety of interesting things that happened. So I'll try to discuss these uh, in some detail. Because I do believe it's important to understand how to do the mapping. And some of these are difficult concepts, clearly. OK. So the green ones, I will not go into in any detail. They were easy. Uh, let me scroll through to the bottom, though, so you can see the full list. So in general, it looks like geography was easy. It looks like the georeferences were easy. And it looks like only a couple other things, like the gender, the catalog number, and the verbatim fields were easy. Now, the interesting thing about this data set, if you look through the field names, the ones at the bottom here, these are their original names. The ones at the bottom all look exactly like Darwin Core. Whereas most of the other fields above do not look like Darwin Core. The reason for that is this collection participated in a large scale georeferencing collaboration. They worked together with other museums to do georeferencing, and they got all those results back as Darwin Core fields and decided that their database would benefit by the addition of these Darwin Core georeference fields. So they added, they just added Darwin Core starting right here to the end of their database. That's why that part was so easy. They had changed their database structure, added new fields, and the new fields were exactly Darwin Core fields. Whereas up above, those are all original data fields. And we can see that that's where a lot of the difficulty came in in trying to do the mappings. OK, so taxon name. Most people decided that that should be scientific name, but at least one person thought it should be a taxon ID. Let me look out a little bit to the right because there is another person over there. So we have two. ID fields were selected, a taxon ID and a scientific name ID. Now if we look in the Darwin Core term definitions to see what those mean, there's a scientific name. Let me go to the top and search in taxon for scientific name ID. So. Scientific name ID says an identifier for the nomenclatural rather than taxonomic details of a scientific name. And it gives an example. It's this strange looking thing here. It's a global unique identifier, basically a number or a string. It's not a scientific name. It's not a taxon name. The same sort of thing is true for the taxon ID. It's an identifier, something like this, rather than the name itself. So that's why the ID fields were not appropriate for the, scientific or for the taxon name field in their spreadsheet. Right? These two are IDs rather than the scientific name. Does that make sense? 
Okay. Verbatim locality and verbatim date were fairly easy. They look exactly like the Darwin core, pretty much. Then we get into date fields. And this database is crazy about date fields. They had began date, ended date, and down below, several more. Begin date day, begin day month, begin day year, end day day, end day month, end day year. And there were perhaps other date fields in here as well. And all of those were problematic. And all of those were in addition to the verbatim date. Now, I'm not exactly sure why this database decided on the sec. <laughs> I'm not sure why this database decided that it should have so many different date fields. Clearly there was a reason on their end, but I don't know what it was. The issue here is that they have duplicated information. They had a verbatim date in which they wrote down exactly as the date appeared on the tag or the label or wherever the original source was. That's great. Original data, so we can always go back to it and see what the information looked like. And if we go to this database and look at verbatim date, you can see that it was populated by things that aren't dates also. So late December of 1977. That's information we don't want to lose. That's information that we don't want to try to turn into a date field because if we do so, we will lose information. So we want to keep that. That's great that they've kept that. Now, what did they do? They interpreted that verbatim date into these other two fields, an end begin date and an end date. So whereas it's unknown here, they know for some reasons that it was between the 1st of January in 1975 and the last of December in 1980. We don't know the reason that they know it's in that range, but they do. It's a necropsy lab. They probably pulled it out of a freezer and were told it was five years old or less. Right. So you can see that sort of thing uh, reflected all throughout here. This one says uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1999. Well, they said, okay, let's go to the beginning of 1998 and the end of 2000. So they put uh, limits on it with actual dates. Okay, so it's good for us that we have the original. But they've gone and done an interpretation. So the verbatim dates that are actually dates turn out to have the begin date and end date be the same thing. 30 July, 30 July, 1960. Okay? They went further than that. And added six more fields to take apart the day part, the month part, and the year part for the beginning and the ending. So this collection is obsessed with dates. They probably want to be able to query in their own database for the year, just to get everything in a particular year, which they couldn't do in a verbatim date field alone. Right? It's not really dates. It doesn't have integers for years, it's this mix of text, not searchable. So they've done something in their database that allows them to do queries on years, beginning and ending. So what do we do about Darwin Core? Well, let's look at what most of you tried to do. Now, some of these aren't wrong. For example, the began date could be used to tell us the start day of the year. And the ended date could be used to tell us the end day of year. That is correct. 
but these data should also end up in the event date. Now, I didn't talk about the event date in detail, but the event date is interesting in Darwin Core. It's interesting because it's not, a, not the kind of a date field that you would find in Excel. A date field in Excel can only contain one day, right? Like today. It cannot contain a range. It cannot contain a begin and an end. But Darwin Core's date field can. Darwin Core's date field is quite sophisticated because it follows something called the ISO 8601 date specification. So it says, use this encoding scheme called ISO 8601 from 2004, version E. That allows us to s express dates as year, followed by month, followed by day, followed, if you would like, by a time zone, followed by a range of hours, and everything on the right hand side is optional. So you can put something like, let's see if that example is in here, I think it is. Um, I don't see, there's so much in here I don't see it. But for example, you can put 2008. 2008 is a perfectly valid event date. And it tells you that it happened in the year 2008. Equally valid is to put 2008-03, which means March of 2008, without a day, right? You can't do that in Excel and have it be a date field. It's not legal. But for an, the ISO expression of dates, you can. Furthermore, you can actually extend it <coughs> to be a range of dates. I don't know if there's an example here. There is. 2007, March 1st, from 1 p.m. in an unspecified time zone, to 2008, on May 11th, in an unspecified time zone, at 3.30. And you do that by putting the slash in between. So, the event date can be quite specific. Oh. Oh, no, I'm working. <laughs> Don't tempt me. So that means that if we're clever, we can build an event date from a combination of the began date and the ended date. And so this is actually the right answer. The two of those can be used to build one event date. But I give credit to all those who said the uh, start day of year, end day of year, because you can determine those from the beginning and ending dates. So, dates in Darwin Core are complicated. We have the event date that allows us to express things quite specifically. In Darwin Core, we also have the start day of year and end day of year, but those are just integers. They would tell me that January 1st is day one. And that in most years, December 31st is 365. 